How's everybody doing? The firewall's almost done as far as bodywork goes. I've got a few little low spots and a couple little uh, pinholes to fix up. But after that, I'm gonna try to get everything taped off and get some primer on this thing. I am ready to be done with this firewall. We got a lot of work to do on this truck. We can stick the motor in here in an afternoon. No problem. We can get the engine in, bolt it in, ready to rock and roll. No problem. But you know, you gotta do this with the fuel line and you don't have this fitting or you gotta do this with the tank or this sending unit's not working or I know we could get the 5.3 in and get the truck running without turbos, but we certainly wanna try to get the turbos on it also. And that in itself is something I've never done. Chase has never done. We do have friends that do it and have done it and have good results out of it. But at the end of the day, the work falls on us. Seriously, there's a lot of stuff to do. There's a lot of little things to work out and those things can take time. It's coming along nicely and regardless of whether or not we get it all done, this truck's definitely gonna look better than it did. It's gonna run better than it did and I'm gonna feel good about it. Chase is gonna feel good about it. This is his favorite truck. You know, Old Mac is kind of his jam, man. He loves, if you haven't figured this out yet about Chase, he loves the oddities. Chase likes the things that not everybody else likes. He finds the uniqueness in them special, I guess. Cause some of the things he likes, I don't like. That Volkswagen Rabbit, oh, not even a rabbit. I don't know, it's the Rabbit pickup. Or a Subaru Brat, those things are hideous, dog. But he loves them. And he loves this long bed and it's not hideous to me. I don't hate this truck, I'm not trying to say that. I actually like this truck and I have some past with it also. But it looks cool and it's gonna be a really rad, you know, machine once it's got turbos. And I want them to stick out the hood. And everybody was against it at first, but if you walk past this truck, we're not, we're, I'm not, Chase may be racing, I don't care about racing, I want it to look cool. If you just look at it, it's just a long bit. Just a long, it's a lowered long bed. Oh yeah, it's a lowered long bed. I want the turbos to stick through the hood. I want the intercooler piping to stick through the hood. Not a lot, not absurdly, because our turbos are not huge, but just enough to you, just to be peeking out of there a little bit so you go, that long bed's got turbos on it. And then you come look at it. That's the idea, that's the objective. I want it to look cool. I would look at it if I saw that. You know what I'm saying? I'm gonna get to work, guys. I've got a low spot right here on the firewall and I've got a couple little divots right here where everything else around it's good but there was a little spot where the putty didn't fill. You can see I've got them circled with pencil. I learned that from uh, a YouTube channel called Sylvester's Customs but and I can't believe I didn't know this. I feel dumb for not knowing it but it's the truth I didn't. He took a pencil and circled his dent or circled his low spot or wherever he was wanting to fill and didn't go any further than he wanted to do body work. But when you're spreading putty and things like that, it's good to have a wider spreader, as wide a spreader as you can handle. You can get it more even. Well, sometimes you're gonna get putty past those points of what you're trying to fill. Cause you do, you need to squeeze it in there. You need to squeeze it in there. But he'll do that. He'll putty right over the pencil mark and then when you come back and you're doing your sanding, the pencil will start showing through when you get to that point of, hey, everything here is flat, so don't keep sanding. Because if you just keep sanding and keep sanding, you're gonna take down everything else that you've just fixed. You know, everything around this, we've already fixed and it's right where we want it. So. This spot here is gonna be the worst because it's, it's actually a little bit bigger low spot. And if I keep sanding and keep sanding and keep sanding here, this is gonna start looking worse again. Everywhere my sandpaper hits it. Before I knew this, and it's still just a guide, because you, you need to come back with your hand and feel it. Feeling it is something that takes time. You can use a paper towel in between your hand and the firewall and that will help you feel it a little bit better. Like, especially in the beginning when you first get started, you can put that paper towel on your hand and rub. Oh yeah. And you can feel where it drops off. Cause you can see right here, I've ended my body work and I can clearly feel where that drops off. But sometimes it's hard to feel. You can guide coat this, you can guide coat your glazing putty and then you can guide coat again when you prime. 
and that's that the guide coat and a good flat block is going to tell the truth about a panel. As long as you don't cheat the block, because if you cheat the block, you cheat in yourself. So this is a very thick Lexan block. This is just homemade. There's some really nice companies out there that make these polycarbonate or Lexan blocks. I actually, I want to get me a set of true blocks. I, 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 that guy makes some nice blocks and I want a set of true blocks. But you can make your own and depending on the thickness of the block, this one is rigid. So this is what, like, this is the flattest spot on this firewall. This block is thin, so I can get it behind these pieces over here. But I'm gonna use a block similar to this for this kind of area. In here, where all these curves are, that's when body work gets hard for me, is these compounding curves. So you're not gonna use a block like this there. You're gonna use something different. But back to cheating the block. When you are sanding body filler, you put that block on there, it needs to be flat through its range of, mo range of motion the entire time. It's, it's easy to trick yourself into doing when you start doing body work is, okay, you see a spot up here that you haven't sanded yet and you wind up kicking that block up so you can sand it. You know what I'm saying? If you wanted to go around this corner, since this is a nice flat corner with this block, or if you had a low spot at the top of that corner, you'd come off, this block is flat, 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 roll. It needs to, it needs to work with the shape of that panel only. Don't be edging your block. Don't be doing this crap. Don't sand in one spot like this trying to get something. Because if you're sanding here and not everything around it, you're just making a low spot. If you have a low spot here, you gotta try to bring all this material down to get to that low spot. You wanna work this area and you can't, like if you're working this low spot, you, can, you, wanna, you wanna sit here and you wanna work that, but you're taking this down next to this now. So body work's never a one spot thing. You always wanna be, I got this low spot, I got this low spot, I gotta get this low spot. But I've gotta make sure everything else around it flows on the same plane. So um, you can never just sand one area. But cheating the block, lifting it, digging with it, you're, gonna, you're just creating problems for yourself. And so that's why I always say, Cheating the block is cheating yourself. It really is. And that's cheating the block, is rolling it up on its edge. This is a DA, uh, dual action sander. They, they kind of go in a circle, but then they go in little miniature circles all at the same time. For me, and for most people, a DA is a prep tool only. I, I, the only time I will sand my bodywork with a DA, if I'm fixing to put on another layer of filler, I'm gonna put on, and I've got a panel that still has low spots and unsanded spots, but I've worked it down to its max. I'll come in with a DA then, just to prep those lows. And I'm, I, a lot of times I'll use a DA with a soft pad. There's actually a pad that goes in between here, and it's like a half inch thick piece of foam. It Velcros on first. I've got one, hold on. This is the pad I'm talking about. This goes on your DA, and then your paper goes on that, and it makes it soft. It makes it soft, so it's, it's really more of a prep tool at that point. It allows it to flow into more spots, because you've got a low spot, and this DA is flat. It's not going to sand that low spot, but this will help. This will help a lot. But I'll use a DA right then to prep this area for another coat of body filler. But here's the thing about a DA and you see so many people doing it. A DA is the same thing as a block when you're using it. It needs to be flat. Unless you're like cleaning up a corner of some metal or you know that you've got no choice, it's easier to get in there with a little pan paper, like uh, just a piece of sandpaper folded in two on your hand and sand that little low spot like that because you're coming back with filler anyway. But don't kick your DA up. Even if you're prepping with 320 because you're fitting a reef prep, you know, you're gonna put some clear on, you're, put, you're sanding with 600. If you kick that block up, even with 600, you're messing it up. 
you're messing it up. And you're gonna look down it, it's gonna look like when the wind barely blows on the water. Just little bitty ripples here and there. And that's from not keeping it flat. But prepping for paint, prepping for body filler, prepping for primer, I'll use a DA. But you're not doing body work with a DA, never. Even though that block is a lot more work, it's worth it in the end to use that block. Since I have to work this area right here, I don't want filler getting down here. I don't want filler getting down here. I don't really want filler getting up here because I don't want to have to rework those areas as much as possible. I always work in sections if I have hard lines or transitional changes because I don't want to be filling all this in with putty either. I don't, I don't need filler in this seam because rust could come from this seam because we didn't blow this truck all the way apart. I don't need, because rust getting underneath it is going to be an issue. And I'm going to come back in here and even get more of this filler out that did get in here. And then we're going to seam, put a nice bead of seam sealer on there. Anyway, I digress back to what I was saying. I use tape to help me section things off where I don't want filler. I just want to keep my filler in the flattest area that I'm working in the smallest workable section I can. So I am gonna tape that area off so that I don't get filler. I can make a nice clean swipe all the way through, get it as flat as I can, and not get filler in all these other places that I don't want filler. So I'm back down here and I'm gonna tape it all back up. Tape is your friend with bodywork for sure. Sometimes when I put my filler on my palette, I know how much area I have to work. And I, I say sometimes, I almost always get more filler than I need. It's a crap show. And I haven't really, since we've started this journey, I really didn't do bodywork for a whole year. I used to do it every day. So I've been kind of getting back in the swing of portions and stuff too, but I do waste some filler, buddy. It's just kind of part of the gig. So I'm gonna use my wide spreader here. First pass, much pressure as I can without digging. Start working it in, get it as smooth as possible. Get your edges as feathered out as possible. This is the conundrum always. Stop messing with it. All right, I brought a little smaller spreader here just to work these small areas. Spread it in there as flatly as you can. And the more feathered out your edges are, the easier it is going to sand. If you have a real hard edge with body filler, it fights you with the sandpaper. Little pinhole there, I'm gonna hit. Little pinhole there, I'm gonna hit. Little pinhole. We don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. That looks good, that looks good, that looks good. All right, let me clean my palette up. Oh wait, pull your tape before the body filler dries. Cause if you pull it after it's dry, it'll chip it all off there. So pull it while it's wet. I do not use paper tear off palettes. I like this plastic one. You just have to clean it before it dries, you know, and cleaning, you need to clean your tools too, clean your spreaders. And I usually throw my spreaders in the filler. I mean, in, that's a can of lacquer thinner. And you keep a lid on your lacquer thinner so it doesn't evaporate on you. It'll make it last a lot longer. I just buy it in bulk and then get a one gallon paint can, a new one, and pour some thinner in there. 
and then take the lid off of it when I need it. But I throw my spreaders in the lacquer thinner, let them soak for a second while I clean my palette. And I just use, we buy these old, they're cut up t-shirts is what they are, but they're great rags. You can buy them by the box for like 30 bucks for a bunch of them. But while I clean that palette, I let these soak and then I clean these off as well. I'll reuse the same spreaders for a long time. I kind of get used to how they work. It sounds weird, but every spreader works different. There's times for a metal spreader. There's times for a plastic spreader. Different size spreaders, different qualities. I like to use the same ones because I know how they, how they move and they get a little more pliable over time for different situations where you're spreading. And I mean, you walk in by anybody guys spreading table and he's probably got 20 of these. Different sizes, cut up ones, little bitty ones. But yeah, you just clean your palette off real clean like that and you can reuse it. I don't, I don't know if the thinner's bad for my hands or not. I've been using it for a long time. It might be on my tombstone someday. But I just put my hands in it and it cleans your hands too. They're nice and clean. There's only so many camera angles you can get when you got something in front of you like this. Your filler's starting to get tacky. That means it's getting close. Especially with glazing putty, it'll gum up your paper real bad, real bad. And it won't sand as good. It sands good dry. We're not trying to take off a lot of material. Um, but I brought a variety of blocks. Of course, I've got the flat Lexan block. I've got this little Dura block. It's a little, and it's used to be about that long. Cut it off. And just to make a small little block for working in areas. And then this, this is a piece of veneer material. It's like a real thin sheet of wood made for gluing onto furniture and things like that. And I use it for some of these tight spots, but it is real flexible. So it lets me work a, a little more contoured area. Um, and I just wrap my paper around it. I use sticky paper. The 3M blue paper is probably the best. It is to me. I use 3M body filler, but Evercoat also makes a really good filler. Um, my glazing putty is actually Evercoat, and my body filler is uh, the 3M Platinum Plus. And just wrap this around this little block and it'll let you get in there. And the more you use it, that wood kind of gets a little more flexible and a little more flexible. So you get an interesting little block out of it. But yeah, everything's starting to get real close now. I'm gonna take me a piece of 120 and just kind of clean up some of this area around everything a little bit while I'm waiting on that to tack up. Anywhere you put your hands on bare metal, you leave that set for a while. You've got so many oils in your hand, those oils will cause rust pretty quick. You know, pretty astonishing amount of time. Usually you wanna try to get this done as fast as possible, but it's just kind of, it happens, man, it happens. You just gotta address it. Don't leave any small little surface rust where your hands were. It rust is your enemy. It's enemy number one for sure. So I'm just kind of hitting up some of them little spots just with some 120. Now here I'm, I'm, I'm really just trying to focus on the metal. So I'm just sticking that to my fingers and using it because we're so close now that anything I do at this point, as long as I don't get crazy, a primer is gonna be able to handle. And this is a time too, when you could come in with a DA and a soft pad and maybe some uh, 180 and focus on some of that bare metal also. As long as you don't get too much on your body filler, the, just the DA and your body filler are not friends. They don't like each other. Not if you want it to look nice. See, these are just places where they may have been touched on too much. It's, it's hard not to touch, but then everybody wants to touch it. Also, everybody wants to feel. Well, keep your hands off of it. That's what I think. 
Okay, I'm gonna start on the biggest area, get it started. We're gonna see if this is gonna gum my paper. It might be a little soon. No, it's gonna go. It's gonna go. With this three-way intersection that I have to I have to work around, I'm gotta sand properly so I don't get a valley where I sand it here and sand it here. You gotta kind of work around. And my block won't get quite back inside there, and that's where I'll use this little skinny block to just go in behind there and finish it up as best as I can. And there's only so good you can get it behind something, and I'm not drilling the spot welds out of that, so. <laughs> Now this is getting pretty close. I'm gonna go ahead and work that back section first. So if I do create any lines out here, I'll be able to fix them with the flat block instead of trying, because you create low spots anywhere that sandpaper hits, so. And you kinda, you can feel in there, but you can also just look and see where the body filler has not been sanded yet. I mean, that's a clear definer that you haven't sanded the area flat. And this is gonna be hard to ever make super perfect behind here, but I want it to be as flat as possible. So if you catch it at an angle or something like that, it still looks nice. If I was smart, I wouldn't have put filler back there, but I screwed up when I started and now I'm paying for my mistakes. Now, I got filler on that bracket like an idiot too. You done messed up, A.A. Ron! But, it's sanding out nice back there. I was getting fooled by the light coming through these little holes here. It looked like there was a spot in the filler I hadn't sanded yet. And I felt it, and I was like, oh no, that's right. So, get this little top side up here, and it's gonna be real hard to see back there. All right, now let's work this back out. Just working around, trying not to stay in one spot too long. It's easy to do in a small area like this. Yeah, man, just a little bitty spot. I don't know how it happened again. It wasn't that big. But, I'll have to hit that one more time. Then in here, I'm gonna double fold a piece of sandpaper and just lightly hit these because they'll fade out real quick. Try to only work them, don't work anything around them. It's gonna be small enough that your primer be able to handle it. Just make sure you get any excess off there. All right, that one's nice. Get this one in here. This one here is behind the engine, but that's it. Yep, 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 that looks good. Now, if you were really going show quality, this would not be, this finger is, can screw you. It can definitely screw you. Well, I got the sandpaper double folded. I folded it once, then folded it twice, and it gives it a little more rigidity and helps it spread the paper out a little more evenly. But you gotta really be careful sanding with your fingers. You never wanna sand with all of your fingers because if you're sanding with all of your fingers, you're creating four different pressure points on something. When you're using something this pliable, you're creating pressure points with all those fingers. So really, you like down here, I'm holding my finger flat as I can in one spot and only working that spot. I am getting some collateral damage on the edges, but then I'm coming back and just kind of blending that out. And this is 120. So it's not cutting crazy hard, but it's just kind of the necessity in this spot. And for what this is, this is gonna be nice. Now that I got that pretty close, I'm gonna come back in with this block, put pressure on it to make it make that contour, work that area a little bit differently now. And you gotta be careful digging into that up, up there too. I've got room, it's not gonna hurt, um, but, that edge of that paper digs a lot harder, so be sure you, if you do it, you make the stroke all the way through. And 
just know what's happening, man. You always, you, you gotta know what your block is doing. And the angles in which you move the block, they all matter. Just finish this off with this little block. It's such a thin amount of material that it's gonna come flat pretty quick. And right there, I kinda dug a little bit. I'm gonna come back with my finger and just wash it. Just kinda slowly feather that out of my pressure will be a little harder here and a little lower there just to try to kind of whipping it through there all that feels good so I just need to hit this spot right here one more little time one more little time and then we're ready for taping this sucker up and putting some primer on it all my body work is pretty dang good. So now I'm finna go through all the firewall and just try to scuff up anywhere where I've got like a hard edge where I might've hit it with a grinder or dug too deep with the DA when I was prepping. Just wanna feather out as much as possible and I also need to come through and scuff everything so the primer will stick. So right now that's a pretty boring process. I'm gonna be bent over for a while. I'm gonna bust that out and then I'll catch up with y'all when I got it back ready to get taped up. That'll be the next step. The time has arrived. I got plastic, tape, everything on here. It's ready to be sprayed. My next step really in this process, I'm gonna go back over it with some wax and grease remover. Make sure there's no grease, handprints, anything like that. Just clean up one last time. Then we're gonna fire up the old drill powered paint mixer and get us some primer on here. And this is my favorite part, like, other than the actual painting itself, but you're gonna to get to see the transformation of what it looks like now to what it's, it's gonna be one solid color. It's gonna look nice and smooth and slick, hopefully. Oh, I quit right when I was gonna record. I got this primer, and if you don't use it all the time, it sits on the shelf and it will start to separate a little bit inside there or something. So it's best to mix it. And at body shops, they have these big banks and all the paint cans go in these banks and they got this lid that goes on with a handle and on top of that handle is a gear that goes into a slot that's got a rod going down in the can with a propeller down there basically. And they're just constantly slowly stirring the paint, constantly stirring it. Well, I got one of those old tops because they're always getting new machines and stuck it on my paint can, had pulled the gear off and I put a drill on there, put a zip tie on the trigger and let it mix, you know, put the drill on low setting, lean it up against something and let it go. It does good. It works in a pinch and it didn't cost no money. The drill will shut off after running for too long like that. And I'm sure it's not the greatest for the drill, but it works and it did the trick. So now I'm gonna get this mixed up, get my cups ready, get my gun ready, drain my water out of my air. We're gonna spray some primer on it. I am not a painter. I have painted things. Now, I know that some body men are painters, and I know that some painters are body men, but I am not one of those dual purpose people. I have painted. If I got somebody holding my hand, I'm a lot better. I do it out of necessity more than anything. I don't uh, really want to do it because there's so many variables. Hey, down here. So this mixes four one to one. Well, it mixes four to one, four parts of your primer, one part of your catalyst. So I'm gonna put one part of this hardener in there, but I'm also gonna put almost one part of reducer just to thin it up a little bit, make it try to lay down a little smoother. So we're gonna go to the two on this one. We're gonna go a little bit above because I went a little bit above there. Oh, that ought to do it. And then we're gonna go with a little bit of reducer. a little bit for good measure. I spilt almost much as I got in there. And we're gonna stir her up. Don't get it on you, like I did. Now, this shirt's gonna have a primer stain in it for the rest of its existence. And I'm so not a painter. I usually have a piece of cardboard standing by so I can work out my spray pattern and air pressure on a piece of cardboard. You can see here, used it a few times already and I'm gonna use it again today 
I hope I didn't forget anything while I'm standing here BS. We're gonna find out right now. Let's see what we look like. Uh, yeah, this one. I like that. All right, wish me luck. In the first part of this section when I was spraying, I was not wearing a respirator. Then I just get caught up in the moment, forget that I'm supposed to be doing that, and forget to do that until I'm halfway through. And I couldn't find it, but I did find it. So this time around, I'm gonna be wearing a respirator. All right, let's get another coat on here. We're gonna put this next coat on really heavy where we have body filler and then not so heavy in places it doesn't need it as heavy. So, let's do it. Well, I got me some runs. I thinned it up a little much on that second go around, but it'll be okay, it's the primer, and I'm not a painter, so it's acceptable. Like I was explaining, this is not really my strong suit. Maybe the more I do, the better I'll get. That's usually how things work. Just haven't done a whole lot of it, but I'm happy. It's all one color. It looks nice. The last part to any painting job is the part I like the least, and that is uh, cleaning up your gun. I just use some lacquer thinner. I, I pre-pour some in this little cup, put some in there, give it a little trigger squeeze shake it around and then I'm gonna go dump it out. I'm gonna dump it out in this other bucket. It'll evaporate and then I repeat the process one more time. I'm squeezing this out into a bucket so we don't um, pollute. Then I'm gonna give it a little air and I'll use my piece of cardboard to see if it's coming out clean or not. All right, so now that it's coming out pretty clean, we're gonna dump this in our other bucket and give it a wipe down. You really wanna get all that paint that's built up anywhere off because it can haunt you in the future. Now this gun will solely be a primer gun. It's a Harbor Freight paint gun. We won't be using it for nice paint jobs, I don't think. And I'll pull my cup. There's a little filter in there. Clean that little filter off. Clean your cup out real good. That's the key, man. Clean this stuff up, take care of it. Even though it's not a Sada or an Iwata, you can still make it last just by cleaning. And it still does a better job than not having one. So I hope this video was informative for y'all. Like I said, don't take my advice on any of the actual painting. I'm not that guy. The body work advice, pretty solid advice. Of course, everybody man's gonna have their own opinion on how this works, and everybody's got their own way of doing things. Some of it's kind of universal also. And it just takes time. You're not gonna be good at it the first time. I wasn't, nobody was. If they tell you they were, they're a liar. I feel confident in talking about most of this stuff because I've done it for a while. So thank you guys for watching, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you and seeing you on the next one.